Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 33. And as you turn there, I want to read a passage from Luke's Gospel. In chapter 13, we're wrapping up <clears throat> Second Chronicles. We've got a couple more chapters. We've been looking at King Hezekiah, who brought revival to the nation of Israel. We looked at a four-chapter, a four-part study. First, we saw him renewing God's place. He refurbished the temple, removed the things that had been put in it, opened the doors that had been shut. After that, we saw them remembering the Passover. And then we saw them reorganizing the priesthood. In our last study, we saw that as a result of these things, they rediscovered God's power. And something that I think we should learn from the scripture is it only takes a generation to reject God's person. One generation. We're always one generation away from revival because when Hezekiah came on the scene, his forefathers had been leading Israel in the wrong direction. He, by God's grace, was used to bring revival and reform and now we're going to see that his son, one generation, takes Israel away from God. The title of our study tonight is this, Unless You Repent. Unless You Repent. And I want to read these words that Jesus says in Luke chapter 13. It says, There was present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower of Salim fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Repentance is not something you hear a lot of in the church these days. And that's very unfortunate. Repentance in the New Testament is a compound Greek word, meta and neo, meta neo. It means to change your mind, to change your mind, to turn around. We tend to think that repentance is, well, you need to get your life all right and then come back to the Lord. Repentance isn't that at all. Repentance is turning back to the Lord and with His grace and help, He helps you get your life right. Religion is what tells us you can fix it. You can make it different. If it is to be, it's up to me. And we see generations of people where that doesn't work. We've got self-righteous people sitting in churches who are far, far, far away from God. And many of those lives are worse than the lives of the heathen. Verse 1. We're going to look at two kings in this chapter. We're going to look at Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, and Amon, his son. Manasseh turned around. He's an Old Testament prodigal. Amon got taken out. And the difference is repentance. Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. He was 12 years old. Now what makes that significant, 
we just mentioned it briefly in our last study, but in the book of Kings, we're told specifically that when Hezekiah was sick, he turned to the Lord in prayer and God graciously gave him 15 more years. Which lets us know that Manasseh was birthed during those 15 years. And we're also told that he reigned for 55 years, which means he was the longest reigning king. In verse 2, we see his rebellion. But he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like unto the abominations of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. What a commentary. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, like the heathen did. Those people groups that were there in the land of Canaan, when God began to bring Israel in, He drove them out because of their sin. A lot of people read the Old Testament, they get bent out of shape over that, but they fail to recognize that God allowed His people to serve in slavery some 400 years in Egypt to be merciful, to give those people in that land the opportunity to repent. Think about that. God allowed His own people to suffer slavery for 400 years to give those people an opportunity to repent. You don't hear about that when they're trying to critique God's Word and God's character. But they didn't repent. And as a result, God drove them out. It's a sad day when the people of God are living like the world. This is a tough message for me as I study certain passages of Scripture. They, they break your heart when you look and see God's record of people, but also when you see His people today doing the same thing. In large groups within the Christian community, it is hard to distinguish the saint from the sinner. Because they talk the same, they drink the same, they smoke the same, they party the same, they act the, th the same, they shack up the same, they vote the same, they do all of these same things. And the Holy Spirit tells us that Manasseh did liken to the abominations of the heathen. What makes it so bad is the children of Israel, through history and observation, watched God remove these people because of their pagan ways, their sinful ways. And yet and still, they did it. That flies in the face of the philosophy that men are good. They're not good. Logic would dictate I can remember when crack really came on the scene and, and people started dying as a result of that. And in my mind, I'm sitting here thinking, all right, I'm sitting in a room with 15 guys. Somebody does crack, falls over dead. I'm done with crack. <laughs> but that doesn't happen. No, sir. The next guy does it and the next guy does it. The next guy does it. Amen. Manasseh has watched the effects of sin repeatedly. God preserved it in a record of His Word. He had been told the stories. He had seen what had happened. And I've shared this to you before, but as a youth pastor for many years, I've, I, I've got relationships with young people that at one time I was their youth, youth pastor and now I, I look on Facebook and those type of things and my heart breaks to see the, lives, the lifestyles that they're living. It's accepted in the church to do the things that the world does. The moment you start talking like this, People immediately start saying, oh, well, you're legalistic, Gordon. No, I'm not. It's the most loving thing that I can say to you tonight. And as a matter of fact, unless you repent, like Jesus said, you shall likewise perish. Why? 
I thought you said God is love. He is. And He loves you so much, He cannot allow you to sin successfully. Amen. Because what God might do to you is a lot less than what sin desires to do to you. God sets those lines in place to protect me, to protect you. Sin is not bad because it's forbidden. Sin is forbidden because it's bad. Verse 3. For he built again the high places which Hezekiah his father had broken down. All the work that Hezekiah did, all the reform, all the revival, he turns around and does the exact opposite. And he reared up the altars of Balaam and made groves and worshipped all the hosts of heaven and served them. He built up the high places. I've said this before. I think about it every time I read this phrase. People love getting high. Which is really just an elevation of self. That's all it is. It's an elevation of self. And that's what these high places were. These individuals brought to themselves gods that they could control. And the reason people don't serve God, Jehovah, is because they can't control Him and they don't want Him controlling them. Amen. But they fail to realize that the life that they desire, that high that they really want, can only be found when God is in control. And it says that he worshiped the host of heaven. Psalm 19.1 says, The heaven declare the glory of God, and the earth is filled with his handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There's no voice nor language where there, there's no, you know, their voice is not heard. Their line is going out through all the earth and to the ends of the world. He goes on to talk about the sun and the tab tabernacle of the sun going from one place in heaven to the other. The stars are worshiping Jehovah and man is worshiping the stars. We still worship stars, literally, astrology, but figuratively as well. And not just in Hollywood, in sports arenas. We've got stars in the church that we worship. The big shots, the big names. We go where they go. We do what they say. Because they promise all kinds of things if we do. Verse 5. says that he built altars. Nope, I'm sorry, verse 4. And he built altars in the house of the Lord. He didn't stop just building things out and about. He brought it into the church. You'd be surprised what's in the church. There's a lot of creepy stuff going on in the church. A lot of things in the church. And because we've rejected God, we don't know that holiness, that power and that glory whereby an Ananias and Sapphira will fall down dead for lying to the Holy Ghost. We've got services now where sinners feel comfortable in. They come in and juke like everybody else and shout and they love the motivational speech. They get pumped up all soulish and emotionally and walk out the door and never once were convicted that there's a God in heaven who is not pleased with the sin in your life. Verse 6, and he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. The worship of Molech or Topheth, we find it oftentimes in the scripture. A fertility god was involved in 
sexual perversion and, and all types of things of that nature. But this God promised fertility, prosperity, crops. It controlled the rain and the sun and those type of things. And these individuals and Manasseh, the king himself, because he wanted personal gain. He wanted his own personal prosperity and blessing. He was willing to sacrifice his child for it. This idol was this iron figure. Hands stretched open was a concave where the hands were. It would be heated red hot and the child, the infant, would have been laid in the hands of that altar, that idol, while they beat the drum to drown out the screams of the child as it died in the hopes that I, the parent, would be blessed by the God to have personal gain and pleasure. And it's happening by the thousands tonight. You say, wait a minute, Gordon, there's no Molech, Topheth. No, it's called abortion tonight. I want my personal pleasure. I don't want to bring this child into the world because this child's going to change my lifestyle. This child's going to interfere with my blessing, my gain, my personal pleasure. Therefore, I will offer it on the altar. I will gladly get rid of it for me. It sickens me that the argument today is a woman's right to her body. Abortion has nothing to do with a woman's body. It's the baby's body. Ooh, don't let me get off on that. She had a choice and a right before that took place. So it's still the same, right? It's sexual perversion that leads to the killing of babies. And so they worship these gods of fertility and all types of sexual perversion practices and then they would offer their child. So we're still worshiping stars and burning babies. Not a lot has changed. Oh, but we have advanced, haven't we? We're educated more than we've ever been. We've made it to the moon. We're, we're smart people. We're still just as sinful and barbaric as we've ever been. And unless you likewise perish, you like, like, unless you repent, ye shall likewise perish. Verse 6, the rest of it. Also he observed times and enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with familiar spirits, with wizards. And he wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Fortune-telling, sorcery, divination, all of these things that are very, very popular today. Oh, he's really going to get legalistic tonight. It is a craze among young people. Some of the most popular book series TV series involve all this type of stuff. Sorcery, witchcraft, and it's cute. Look at the cute little witches. There's no such thing as a cute little witch. Amen. There's, there's no such thing as a, as a nerdy wizard wearing glasses. There's no such thing. But notice what the enemy does. He's subtle. We're told that in the third chapter of the Bible. He was the most subtle of all that God created. He slithers his way in. He waters it down just long enough to get you hooked. And then he draws you in and consumes you. And unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. In verse 7, and he set a carved image, the idol which he had made. So not only did he do as the abominations of the heathen and serve and worship their gods, he imagined, concocted, invented his own God to serve, which is really the height of idolatry. That's where it's heading. That's where the enemy is trying to take you and me to be our own God. They call it humanism today, but that just sounds too nice. 
as far as I'm concerned. But man is his own God, his own imagination. But before we get too upset with people outside of the church, there are countless believers who don't know the scripture, therefore they don't know their, their God, therefore they imagine their own kind of ideas about who he is and what he does. They'll tell themselves things like, God understands. That is true, he understands. But he's not going to go along with you. They'll say things like, well, you know, I'm not perfect, I'm just forgiven. What about the scripture says, be therefore perfect, even as your Father is in heaven is perfect? Or be ye holy, as I am holy, saith the Lord. Imagining their own thing, he carved out this own image, and he did so in the house of God, which God said to David and to Solomon his son, in this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Neither will I any more remove the foot of Israel from out of the land which I have appointed for your fathers, so that they will take heed to do all that I have commanded them according to the whole land and the statutes and the ordinances by the hand of Moses. So Manasseh made Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to err and to do worse than the heathen whom the Lord God had destroyed before the children of Israel. This is the second mention of God dealing with the heathen, the pagans, the unbelievers, and removing them from the land, and now Israel is doing that. But we're told that Manasseh did worse. You haven't seen nothing until you've seen a sinning saint. You know, we love to look down our nose at people out there in the world and expect them to be something other than what they are. Sinners. They don't know God. They can't produce anything good. But there are saints that parade their sin. You say, I don't know about that, Gordon. Paul dealt with it in the Corinthian church. He says, you've got somebody running around in the church living in sin, and not only do you, not con you don't condemn it, you condone it. You let him just walk around in the church like he's... All that. But you know, we, we can't judge anybody. We can't be mean. I'm not judging or being mean to anybody. But sin is sin. And somebody needs to tell it. Because that's the most loving thing you could do. But when a saint starts sinning, Verse 10, And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. God sent Isaiah to prophesy at this time to these people. They would not listen. One of the hardest things as a pastor is to watch the lives of individuals going in a direction that they shouldn't go and being in services where I know God is speaking, or being in Bible studies where God is speaking about the very thing that this individual is doing, and watch them not hearken. It's heartbreaking. And I've been that somebody at times where God is speaking, and I ain't listening. Shake the preacher's hand on the way out. Oh, you'd have got them if they'd have been here, preacher. Do you know that God is always speaking? He's always speaking to His people. The problem is, is I'm not always listening. And what's even worse, sometimes I don't want to hear it. Verse 11, Wherefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the host of the king of Assyria, which took Manasseh among the thorns, bound him with fetters, and carried him to Babylon. His rebellion continued until he was taken captive. We've seen it over and over again in the Kings and in Chronicles. This is what sin does. Oh, it was 
You just imagine, it was all new and fresh. Manasseh come along and he says, yeah, they didn't get it right the last time. That, that's what the problem was. People are trying to sell stuff to us today in this country. It's never worked anywhere and all over the globe, but, but it's going to work when we get to do it. And so, so he's come along and he says, oh, we're going to make this work. People are getting excited because it feels good and it's pleasurable. And everybody's having a great time. Until you drink one too many beers and you're puking your guts up. Or even worse, you run over a child crossing the street on the way home. That's the way the enemy operates. Now, you know, smoking is, is more taboo uh, socially than it used to be, but it used to be the cool thing. You know, remember the Marlboro Man? You know, the rough, the tough, the rugged, tall, dark, handsome dude. Why did they never show anybody with a trach on oxygen being eaten up with cancer to sell cigarettes? They never do. Same with alcohol. All these in-shape beach body people drinking their alcohol and it's just great, glorious, and grand. They never tell the story of the drunkard that beats his wife and his kids. They never tell all of that stuff because the serpent is more subtle than every other creature that God had created. If you've ever been fishing, you reach down in the can of dirt and you want to bring out the fattest, juiciest earthworm in there, the one that's just wiggling like crazy and he's about a quarter of inch thick, like a baby snake. And because you want to wrap him around that hook, you want his juices flowing, you want to wrap him three or four times where you just got two little ends just doing like this on the side because you don't want the fish to see the hook. You just want him preoccupied with the bait. And that's what the enemy does. He throws the bait out there. And it looks easy. Fish didn't have to lay in wait and sit for hours. He didn't have to go all over the pond or the lake or the creek trying to find it. Just pop. It's just right there. Fat and juicy and saying, come and get it. He latches on. And what he doesn't realize on top of the surface. There's a dude on the boat or the dock or the shore. Fish on! Fish on! And it's all over but the crying. You can fight. You can wiggle. You can tug. You can tussle. But you're going to get weaker and weaker and weaker until finally you break the surface and now you're in a place that you were never intended to be. And it's a matter of time in that atmosphere that you die. And unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. But here's the good news. Whew, that bad news is rough, isn't it? We've looked at his rebellion. Now his realization. This is the good news. Verse 12. He's there in Babylon. And when he was in affliction, affliction is good. C.S. Lewis said, suffering is God's megaphone. Don't do that. That hurts. <laughs> That's suffering. God allows that to take place in our life. You do something you shouldn't do. There's pain and suffering as a result. You are supposed to say, ain't doing that again. Amen. Some of us are a little slower than others. God tried. We've read. God tried to compel them. God used prophets. He uses Sunday school teachers. He uses parents, grandparents. He uses neighbors, co-workers, bosses. Sunday school teachers, youth pastors, Christian friends. He uses people to reach out, to reach out, to call out, to call out, to reach out. And what God is hoping is we'll listen, we'll hear, we'll turn to Him. But if we harden our heart, 
affliction will come. Because God knows unless the will is broken, true surrender won't take place. One of the hardest things to do with someone that you love is to watch them have to get to this place. And, and it's hard to try to decide what to do. It's, it's hard to, to decipher. You really need to seek the Lord for wisdom because you want more than anything to just jump in there and just snatch them out of where they're at. And so you're, you're, you're constantly saying, Lord, do I reach out? Do I back off? Do I, what, what, what do I do? But now he's in affliction. He's the Old Testament prodigal. He's in the pig pen. He's in that place that we don't want people to go. But until you realize that sin is truly sinful, until you get to that place where you say, I've had enough of this. I don't want any more of this. You ever been to that place? I've been to that place. I've been to that place where I say, Lord, I'm done with this. Do what, do what you have to do. I can't pray that prayer. Had a preacher tell me one time that he had a line of people that were coming up for prayer at the end of the service. And this individual stood up there in front of him. He said, what's your prayer request, brother? He said, I want to I wanna break this habit of smoking. I, I just need to quit. He said, okay, pray this prayer after me. Put his hands on his shoulders. He said, dear Lord. The young man said, dear Lord. He said, I will never he said, I will never pick up another pack of cigarettes. Silence. He said, pick up another pack of cigarettes. Silence. He opens his eyes. He looks at the young man, and the young man said, I can't pray that prayer. The preacher says, well, God can't deliver you. Next. Psalm 119, I believe it's verse 71. The psalmist said, it was good that I had been afflicted because I turned to your statutes. I turned to your word. It was good that I had been afflicted. In this affliction, verse 12 said, he besought the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers. Verse 13, and prayed unto him. His rebellion turned to his realization which led to his repentance. His repentance and it says, and heard his supplication and brought him again to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord, he was God. That's when he knew. When God brought him back from that place. Now I'm not in this camp, unfortunately. I wish I could tell you. Smart people look at the heathen and say, nope, don't need that. I'm serving the Lord. Slow people, I won't say dumb because I'll offend somebody. Slow people, they see them doing it and go, they didn't do it right. Watch me. But he comes to his senses and he cries out to the Lord. And the Lord doesn't say, you've done witchcraft, familiar spirits, you've observed times, you've got idols and altars in my house, you've sacrificed your children, you've led the whole nation back into sin, nope, done with you, out of here. He doesn't. He's gracious. He's merciful. He's slow to anger. He's long-suffering. And so tonight, if there's something that you or I, we need to repent of, all we have to do is repent, turn back to the Lord, and He is gracious. He'll forgive. So what does real repentance look like, though? Because I think we live in a day and an age where we confuse confession with repentance. We've got some professional confessors in the church. And I've, I've been one. 
For many years, I had an anger issue. I'm embarrassed to admit it. If you want to know all the bad details, you can talk to my kids and talk to my wife. And I kept saying, sorry, honey. Sorry, son. And lose my temper again. Sorry, baby. Lose it again. Sorry, son. Lose it again. You see, I was never repenting. I was confessing. Confession is good. But if you've ever been on the receiving end of confession, after a while, it gets old. You get tired of, you know what? You get to the place where until you're really serious about it, just don't say sorry no more. And we have that in the church where people, they go and do what they do and they come back, hey, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And they go do what they do, hey, back, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. They go do it. That's confession. That's not repentance. That's confession. Yes, God will forgive you. That's the good news. And there are a lot of people who think, and Paul dealt with this in Romans, Romans chapter 6, shall we sin that grace may, may abound? God forbid. How shall we who are dead uh, to sin live any longer therein? But some people have that, well, God's gracious, He's merciful, I'm just going to do whatever I want to go to, He's going to forgive me anyway. He will forgive you, there's no doubt about it, He's promised it. But there are consequences for your actions. There are consequences. And sometimes God graciously removes those consequences, but sometimes He doesn't. Sometimes He leaves them in place. Look at the first thing He does, does verse 14. The first step of true repentance is described here in this verse. And after this, after he repented, after he turned back to the Lord, after he cried out, after this he built a wall without the city of David on the west side of Gihon in the valley after the entering in of the fish gate and compassed about Ophel, and raised it up a very great height, and put captains of war in all the fenced cities of Judah. The first thing he does is reestablish boundaries. He reestablishes boundaries. He puts in place a perimeter. Christians today call that legalism. It's not. Legalism is me telling you, you can't do A, B, C, or D. That's legalism. Legalism is not me saying, nope, I won't go there. I won't do that. I'm not going to talk like that. I'm not going to look at that. I'm not going to think about that. I'm going to build this wall so that the enemy stays on the outside. That's when you know a person is truly repentant. When they are establishing boundaries for themselves. They're not asking somebody else to do it. They're not making excuses. Well, you know, I, I'll get around to that wall over there. I know an enemy hops over every now and then, but you know, hey, nobody's perfect. That's not repentance. That's not repentance. The first step of true repentance is establishing those boundaries, putting it in place. I think I've got an amen in here somewhere. Hold on. <laughs> Look at verse 15. Here's the second thing that true repentance does. And he took away the strange gods and the idol out of the house of the Lord and all the altars that he had built in the mount of of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem and cast them out of the city. First, there's a perimeter. He reestablishes the boundaries. Second, he removes the strange God and idols. Purity. Purity. True repentance involves purity. It involves me saying, this will not be a part of my life. That's true repentance. And in my case, as I shared earlier about anger, True repentance was, the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Lord, I can't handle anger. You say, be angry and sin not. So, I'm going to leave the anger to you. I'm going to leave the control to you. You say, a soft answer turneth away wrath. Therefore, with your help and grace, I'm not raising my voice anymore. That's true repentance. 
getting these things out of our life that shouldn't be in our lives. Purity. Purity. The third thing we see in his life, a picture of repentance, is in 16. And he repaired the altar of the Lord and sacrificed thereon peace offerings and thank offerings and commanded Judah to serve the Lord God of Israel. He repaired the altar. He repaired the altar. He returned to the Lord. We need to reestablish the altar in our lives. A picture of prayer, seeking the Lord, communing with the Lord, talking to the Lord, looking to the Lord, living an altered play on words, an altered life. It's hard to truly seek the Lord in prayer and live in sin. It just doesn't happen. We, we stop praying and we start sinning. If we'll stay in prayer, stay in His presence, we'll do a whole lot less sinning. If you don't believe it, prove me wrong. I challenge you to 21 days of praying more than you ever have prayed, every opportunity that you have and can pray, driving down the road, any time that you can do it, pray, and I guarantee you, you'll spend less time in sin during those 21 days. He established a perimeter. He set those boundaries. I'm not doing that. Yeah, but everybody's doing it. No, they ain't, because I'm a somebody. That means everybody ain't doing it, because I'm not. Yeah, but that's lonely. What do you mean lonely? God is with me. He'll never leave me nor forsake me. I'm not alone. That's right. That's right. What's lonely is all those poor saps over there doing what they know they shouldn't be doing. And they're miserable, faking that they're happy. And I'm over here with none of their heartache and trouble. Amen. So setting up that perimeter and then bringing purity in that perimeter. Do you know if you'll surrender your life to Christ, the devil can't do nothing to you? Amen. And man can't do nothing to you? Amen. And the government can't do nothing to you? And your enemies can't do nothing to you? That is beautiful. That's fail-proof. Who wouldn't want that? To set up a perimeter and say, Lord, the boundary lines have fallen to me in pleasant places, like the psalmist says. This is yours. I'm dedicating this to you. And now, with your help, I'm going to get everything out of here that's not pleasing to you because I want all you in this place. And I'm just going to spend my time in prayer and fellowship with you. That is glorious. That's the best thing this side of heaven that's available to you. That's what real repentance looks like. Nevertheless, the people did sacrifice, verse 17, still in the high places, yet unto the Lord God only. Now the rest of the acts of Manasseh and his prayers unto his God and the words of the seers that spake unto him in the name of the Lord God of Israel, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel. His prayer also and how God had entreated for him and all his sin and his trespass and the places wherein he built high places and set up groves and graven images before he was humbled. Behold, they are written among the sayings of the seers. So Manasseh slept with his fathers and they buried him in the house, buried him in his own house and Amon, his son, reigned in his stead. So Manasseh turned around and we're gonna see the, the exact opposite with Amon, his son. He is taken out. And those are really our choices. Turn around or get taken out. That's how it works. Jesus said, unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Turn around or get taken out. Amon was two and twenty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned two years in Jerusalem. It didn't last very long, did it? And here's his apostasy, verse 22. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as did Manasseh, his father. He's witnessing his father's life. He's watched his father live in blatant sin and end up in captivity. He watched his father repent and turn around, get back on track with the Lord. And he's got both of those examples in front of him and he makes this choice. I'll choose this one that led to captivity. 
So he forsakes the way of his father. It says, For Amon sacrificed unto all the carved images which Manasseh his father had made and served them. So we see his apostasy. Verse 23, we see his arrogance. And humbled not himself before the Lord as Manasseh his father had humbled himself. But Amon trespassed more and more. We see sin's slippery slope. Sin's slippery slope. It starts off small. We're living in a day and an age where people are absolute, in absolute denial of that truth. Amen. Statistics prove that marijuana is a gateway drug. Statistics prove it. And yet, people say, no, nope, I can do this. My father, I don't want to dishonor him tonight, but he was an addict. And he would look me in the face. I can't tell you how many times he did this. He looked me in the face and he say, I can manage this. I'm in control of this. I can do this in moderation. Now what I witnessed was a long way from moderation. I I've seen some sad situations in his life. That's not moderation. But see, the enemy will tell us, you got this. You got this. And even if, even if my anger, I'll just keep talking about myself so I don't get in trouble here. Even if my anger never leads me to the place that I take another human being's life, do you know how much destruction I can do in people's lives? What if, what if I just toy around with my anger and just yell for the rest of my life? Act out. I didn't hurt nobody. Really. Talk, talk to the people that are being yelled at. Ask them if it's hurting. So, so even, if, even if that slippery slope don't take me all the way down, the impact that it's having, but the enemy is a deceiver. He wants to hide that. So maybe, maybe my sin is pride. And I think I'm better than everybody else. But I just think it. I don't say it. So nobody knows it. They know it. They know it. It's, it's all over you. You're walking around like you're, you're, you're all that in a bag of chips. And it comes out in your attitude and your mannerisms and what you say. And people are, are tired of it. They're sick of it. And, and they'll withdraw from that because they're not interested in that. And you'll sit there and say it's their problem. That's, that's that slippery, that's the, he sinned more and more and more. And every sin is that way. All sin is that way. Not just the big ones that we like to label. We label the, those, I think, because it makes us feel better about ourselves. I ain't killing nobody. Great. <laughs> you really did set the bar high, didn't you there, buddy? Oh, I'm better than that guy. What is that going to get you at the end of the day? They don't pass out trophies for being better than that guy. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to give an account. I'm going to give an account for what I do in my life. And compromise and sin just a little bit leads further and further and further and further. It always does. It always does. Whether it be a sexual sin. Most of them start with a look. Think about that. It's just a look. Just a look. You, see, you hear guys say, I'm just looking at the menu. I ain't placing an order. It's just a look. And that's where Jesus gets into this, doesn't he? He says, if you look, that's the start. You have, I can go down the list. Alcohol, drugs. You can just go down the list. Just name them all. You can just name any sin you want to sin. That's how they start. Really small. And they get more and more and more and more because you think you're in control. And the enemy will play cat and mouse with you. And he'll let you, he'll let you take some pieces off the chessboard of his. And every time you do, and if you're not real smart, you're like me, you're playing checkers, right? Either way, he'll, he'll, he'll let you take a few pieces off here and there and make you think you got this. 
you get more confident, and then one move too many. Checkmate. And then he will laugh at you. When he was applauding you when you started, yeah, you're a man. Sister, you got this. You go, girl. I mean, he'll applaud you. He'll give you trophies. He'll let you advance in the levels of the game that you're playing. And then he'll kick it all out from under your feet, watch you fall, and laugh and mock you all the way down. And then drag you off into captivity. And unless you repent, he shall all likewise perish. He humbled not himself before the Lord, as Manasseh, his father, had humbled himself. And Amon trespassed more and more. And his servants conspired against him. What he thought he was in control of turned on him. What a picture. It always does. It always does and slew him in his own house. Galatians 6, 7 says, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Numbers 32, 23, I think. It might be the other way around. Be sure your sins will find you out. And the people of the land slew all them that had conspired against King Ammon. And the people of the land made Josiah, his son, king in his stead. True repentance, setting up boundaries in our lives, setting up that perimeter, removing the strange god and gods and idols, bringing purity back into our life, repairing the altar, praying and seeking the Lord every day. That's what true repentance looks like. That's what will keep us out of trouble. The only alternative is that slippery slope, that sinful snowball that just gets faster and faster, bigger and bigger, until it becomes an avalanche. For the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. It's been happening ever since the garden. And it's happening tonight. And let a man take heed. If he thinks, he stands, lest he fall. So let's not make the mistake tonight, starting up here, of saying, oh, that message is not for me. That's for somebody else. Because unless I repent, I shall likewise perish. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word tonight.